Hi, my name is Sophia Levin and this is Uncommon. Uncommon is a production by Neural, an agency that helps both brands and talent tell their story. To learn more, just visit neural.com. That's N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E.com. My guest this week, Sophia Levin, food writer and founder at The Seasoned Traveller. Uh, I've got to ask, I found some amazing videos of you as a kid, by the way. Oh, you went deep yeah, into YouTube. super deep. Um, <laughs> we, Jacob and I, Jacob always does like my pre-research to get things flowing. It's amazing because it saves me hours now. We were debating things like dogs, does she still get up at 5.30 a.m., north side versus south side, but the thing for me was dip. <laughs> dip and also, do you like chocolate still? I Do you know what? In the last maybe three, four or five years, my sweet tooth has dissipated severely. So maybe okay. that was a self-fulfilling prophecy and I just didn't realise it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Dip, the, the dip looks like some sort of cheesy kitty dip. I don't know what it was, but I, I really wanted it, yeah. as you can see from the video. And I still love dip. Yeah. Dip is always in the fridge. Yeah, you were quite a character as a kid. Like, I'm already clucky enough for kids, but I was watching that and I'm like, this is this looks like a lot of fun. I'm sure being a parent is a lot harder than just moments like that, but it was very it was very endearing. So what what, what was the point of those videos? Had, did you need to upload it for something? How, how come they're on your YouTube channel? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because they're... I, I don't think I'd truly considered YouTube at that point until okay. you'd mentioned it just then. I thought, oh, I forgot that existed. So I, I sort of see the YouTube channel now as seasoned traveller, a little bit more professional. Yeah. <laughs> I think at the time I was probably going for a video gig that uh, I put maybe on that channel. There would have been a couple of other things yeah. that might have had something brandy attached to them Yeah. Um, that I wanted to send somebody and then probably just for fun. Dad had likely shown me those videos and I just chucked them up there for yeah. for a bit of variety. Well, I was thinking like it, it's – for me it was like obviously that was like, you know, if you talk about someone's story, that's the first food moments of their life, which is literally like a question I had. It was tell me about the earliest food memory of your childhood. Oh, that's a – how far do you go back, right? Um, I mean things, things stick out in my mind. My mm. family's full of food rituals um, maybe okay. which – comes from being raised culturally Jewish, I guess, but I think just my parents being super enthusiastic about food in general. So dad and I used to go for lunch um, at an Italian restaurant in okay. in the south sort of Turak village uh, yeah. for ravioli, okay. um, which I used to call square nunus <laughs> square and still nunus. do sometimes. <laughs> uh, every Friday night we do our version of Shabbat, which just okay. means eating together. Yeah. Used to, used to be... Something that started with chicken soup, but my grandma's no longer around on that side. Okay. So now it's just whatever we feel like cooking. Okay. What mom feels like cooking, I should give her more credit. She does it probably oh, <laughs> most of the year. Yeah. Uh, and then Sunday brunch is still a thing in my family. Um, so my well, like catching up with family. Yeah. So every Sunday we'll go we'll go out for brunch. When hmm. I mean, one of my brothers lives overseas, so he doesn't make it. But when he's here, and before he went, he did. Another one still lives at home. Okay. And then my husband and I um, will go whenever. It's not too much of an early start and we're not too busy, but that's most weeks. Yeah. Yeah, this I, I don't know what it is. I, I guess, uh, like, I, I relate. I, I guess I'm slightly jealous of that, like, you know, the Friday, Sunday thing because my favourite thing as a kid growing up was, and this is why I like storytelling, it was the hush at the table when, like, one person spoke because you have a family extended family there'd be like 10 15 people there it was mainly like my grandfather or one of the uncles would speak and it'd be some very philosophical story of some kind so i have absolutely no idea what you're talking about because usually in my family everyone is speaking oh, we, at once we have that too don't, there was don't never worry a hush. don't it's, worry it's and a battle to the end <laughs> this is the this is the thing now which like i was i was thinking about like sunday night we my brother preferred to have dinner at the family home for his birthday and like, just there's always we were like debate. We debated for twenty minutes with my dad around why, like, he was making this argument around like why small business won't come back in the city and all this other oh. shit. And like by the end of it, I don't think he really knew what his argument was. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow it ended up in like a discussion around St Kilda Football Club. 
Like oh, it's just, as it always does. As right? it always does. Yeah. Um, I've always grown up with that, and that's why I guess I'm I'm slightly jealous of this ritual that you have every Friday mm. or Sunday. I wish we could do that more. You I can. Think. You can. You can. I can. But people do say that. Wow, you you see your family a lot. I'm yeah. like, yeah, I like them. I'm, yeah. I'm very lucky. You know, yeah. we all get along. No, that's the that's yeah. the only thing I do. I would say. <sighs> We, we actually catch up with family quite a lot. Yeah, and footy is actually one of those things. Uh, so I get this question because I'm not, I'm not overly passionate about the footy, but I'm still a member of St Kilda. We still have our seats. We go every week. And it's mainly because we sit there as a group and there's like 15 of us. That's a ritual. And it's, yeah, it's you just get to chat, see each other. Um, there's something nice about it, mm. I'd say. Growing up, was there like particular lessons that you still hold or principles at all from your family? And it could be from a parent, could be from a grandparent. Mm, yeah, I think I think the thing that runs deep through everyone in my family, good, in good ways and bad ways, is probably enthusiasm and how contagious okay. that is. Uh, and I've only really realised it in the last few years, but whether, you know, that's something that, mum is eating that might be different or scary for a child, okay. doing that with enthusiasm rather than putting it in front of you and expecting you to eat it or forcing you to eat it, just that modelling of being interested in food and other cultures and people, mm. um, I think probably was really contagious if I had to put it down to something. Yeah. Um, dad's enthusiasm for just, you know, anything I wanted to do or try, I, I do come from a medical family, or at least I did until I broke that cycle. <laughs> but my parents were always really supportive um, That's so funny. of, you know, being a writer. <laughs> did, did, on, just on that, did yeah. they like, because my dad was like, I had to do a profession. So I did like accounting. It was either accounting, law, doctor or something like that. Did you have that as well growing they, up? They tried, um, they, but it wasn't a forceful sort of comment. It was more a suggestion. I did I did yeah. quite well in a traditional sense at school. So there were a few times it was like, are you sure you don't want to just give med or law a okay. try? Yeah. You know, just give it a give it a shot. And then when I was absolutely not, when I graduated, I also went straight into freelance journalism. So I've never fully had a proper um, traditional employment path. And I do remember mum saying, you know, just Maybe just go and work in an office just for a year, just so you can see what it's like. <laughs> Six months, three months, just just a normal office, and that didn't really happen either. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, th I look. I think with dad, it was a forceful suggestion. He's like, "You've you got to do accounting. You got to do this. You got to do that." And uh, yeah, uh, it's funny when you do accept that, you often find your way into the thing that you wanted to do anyway. Like I'm not in the industry that. You end up back there. Yeah. Or you end up miserable. <laughs> and you stay there, which is not me because, you know, very disagreeable family, willing to argue on anything. I just wanted to rebel, essentially. I just remember I did my grad role. I did what your parents probably suggested where I had six weeks in an office and I was like, there is no fucking way I'm doing this. I did internships. I definitely did. I, I spent a few months um, unpaid, of course, in a, a social media role. And it was one of the first social media companies that e existed. I don't think it does anymore. Yeah. It was an arm or something else. And it was it was great. Like the people were cool and young and fun and there was a ping pong table and it was in the city and we'd knock off before 12 and have drinks on a Friday. And I still hated it. I just didn't want to be at a desk. And that's when I sort of found myself um, sending cold emails to publishers saying, you know, hi, I would like to do some writing for you and pretending I knew way more than I did. But that mm. was in a job that would have been considered a great one. Yeah. So you obviously like a very headstrong and switched on about what you wanted to do. I remember we were talking about the hospitality thing before. I was engrossed with hospitality. I would read the Epicure. When it was the Epicure, I'd read it every Tuesday. Tuesday. Because <laughs> my parents got the Herald Sun and so I would be like, why can't we get the age? So I'd go and spend uh, the whatever, two bucks or whatever it is on just getting the age, chuck that out, keep the Epicure. Yeah. And I just, I, I loved it. And I would, I, I remember some of the old, um, I can't even remember their names now. It's actually really fucking annoying because I've got some of the old school writers from that era that were like gods and even like some of the wine reviewers and I would just email them. Did I'd they just write about back? Yeah, they wrote back. Right. Good. Like a couple of them did, a couple of them didn't, but most wrote back. Like let's, saw, let's say 60-40. And like if I could find those emails in hindsight, like I'd be, 
mortified because like you can you again you come across like you know everything at that age but you really know nothing but it's just that passion that you have for getting out there and doing it is so intriguing and I guess I was you know we went through your early studies you obviously did arts you went overseas you wrote some stuff about food and travel and whatnot realized that there was an impact from it came back switched more to the writing side I think yeah, it was. so it was. It, I was studying a, a, a double major on an art scholarship. That's right. So it was psychology and psychology marketing. Psychology was the one. Yeah. Um, and psych was just because I I find it fascinating. I still do. Uh, I loved my teacher at high school, and just thought I'd keep going with it. And there was at that time an actual Monash degree, which which was psychology marketing. And then when I was offered a scholarship, I said, "Oh, I really want to do these subjects." And I said, "Well, just replicate." the course under an arts degree, which is what I did, which was so lucky in hindsight, because then when I went overseas, I was like, oh, the marketing isn't the type of writing that I want to do. It's it's journalism. Um, mm. And you only sort of realise that's a year and a half into the course and thinking, wow, I really don't need any more of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> I just want to write. <laughs> which is probably the better time to realise it yeah. rather than at the end of the degree. Definitely. And it, it just meant that... Um, that marketing subject switched to a minor and I think I, I did an extra semester. It didn't feel like I was behind or had to start again. And it was just fascinating how interlinked marketing psychology and journalism all were, even more so now, I would mm. say. Yeah. So none of it felt like a waste. It just felt like a journey. Yeah. And uh, I mean, for you, when you found the food component, I mean, you've said it many times in interviews, in your own work for the seasoned traveler, whatever it may be, that it's about sort of finding a connection amongst culture. I mean, I you know I'm obsessed with Bourdain. Eddie Hong is is another one. Um, the Fresh Off the Boat series for me was like, just, like I, I just absolutely loved it. And it made everything less political, less trivial, just a bit easier. Like it, it's a pretty universal language, food. So uh, from your perspective, where was it? Or when did you realise that it was that for you? Yeah, I mean, I you sort of touch on it, touched on it then, but I, I think food really is a window into, if not understanding some pretty complex issues, then at least absorbing them subconsciously. Mm. And then maybe next time you try that dish or sit at a table with a person who's not quite like you, you've already got an entry point into that understanding Yeah. without realising it, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky to... <laughs> travel a lot, remember travel. Uh, growing up, especially, my most of my family is based in the UK, um, which oh, really? is a long way when um, your grandparents are getting a bit older, um, but they're, they're, they're young and vital in the most amazing ways. But so we would see them over there, that's my mum's parents, but then, you know, meet them in other places that were essentially halfway, which often was Asia. And also because my grandpa likes a warm climate. And so I think I was exposed to a lot of different foods and cultures my whole life growing up. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess just coming back here to Melbourne, Australia, where we are so lucky to have most of those cultures represented yeah. in a culinary sense here. It was it was just there already, and I think especially not being able to travel now as someone who writes about food overseas, mm. uh, there's nowhere else I'd rather be stuck while borders are closed than right yeah, here at th home in Melbourne. I was thinking that, yeah. the The amount of differentiation we get is stunning. Like it's we're actually incredibly lucky, and you don't realize it until you go away. Yeah, but in the in the nineties, sort of two thousands, uh, there wasn't as much of an interest in regional cuisine. No which we're getting a lot more of now. Yeah. So I probably wouldn't say now, oh, let's go out for Chinese food. I'd say, you know, who wants Sichuan yeah, tonight, yeah, yeah. which I think is really cool. And well, that just shows further acceptance, well, not even acceptance, just embracing of different cultures through fun, food. It's funny you mention that because there's a period in our life where my parents' business was struggling and then it started doing well. We moved from Bentley to Brighton. We would only get to go out for dinner on a birthday. And it, that was the year of like you would you would go for Italian or French or Thai or whatever it may be. And when I think about the last couple of years, I've been asking friends, like particularly Italian friends or Greek friends or whatever it may be, 
I say to them, where can I get some Cretan food or where can I get some Milanese? Like I asked a friend recently, like, where's good for Milanese? And that's when I started realizing like, oh, okay, we are very regional now. And then she'd reply and be like, oh, well, there's not really like much good Milanese. And then you realize, oh, shit, there's an opportunity there. Yeah. Um, so I think you're right. I think you're definitely right. I, I was curious, you know, you mentioned traveling through Asia. Was there a particular dish story time with that fa- with family that, you always remember or daydream about? <laughs> Funnily enough, <laughs> I daydream more about travel that I've done by myself. Okay. Uh, or I have, I've had lots of amazing experiences with my family. I do. <laughs> um, we, the last big trip that we did, we went to the north of India together. So this is not, this is not that long ago. So it was my two adult brothers, okay. myself, both grandparents, both parents and my uncle. Okay. And I was just, I was a project manager. It wasn't a holiday. <laughs> I was trying to get everybody out the door at the same time and dragging them along to eat. Oh, actually, I do have a memory, but it's not Asia. Okay. Um, with the exact same group of people. Yeah. Uh, welcome to my brain. I've just interrupted myself. And we went to Egypt together. Oh, really? Which was an amazing trip. And we had a minivan because there were so many of us. Uh, And I remember mum and I hanging out the window looking at all the people selling delicious food on the street and we made our driver pull over, much to the absolute horror of all the boys. And we're like, we need to eat this. We need to get off the bus. Get off the bus. Stop the bus. (laughs) And so we go up to this street vendor and he's he's selling koshery, which is all the carbs. It's this amazing dish that it's, it's really sweet from lots of onion, but it's pretty much pasta chickpeas, rice, onion, and all the wow. sort of spices throughout it. And it's, it's heavy. I mean, it, it, it keeps you going and that's the point of it. But okay. um, that was years and years and years ago. And now I've started to see it um, in articles on SBS Food, more in, more in Sydney than we have here in Melbourne. As far as I know, we only have one really legit Egyptian restaurant Yeah, we don't, we don't have a strong mm. uh, Middle Eastern culture here in Melbourne as opposed to, as strong as Sydney. There's no doubt about that. Out of interest, when you were in Egypt, what year was that? Mm, I knew you were going to ask that. It was just before their last major, major political unrest. So before like the Arab Spring. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we were in Europe in 2012. Lauren and I traveled all of We went to Turkey, family's Greek Cypriot. So we'd gone to sort of that part of the world and we'd really wanted to go to Egypt and Israel and stuff like that, but uh, things were just cooking up nicely then. I think I remember we were in Turkey and like uh, there was a plane that got shot down over the border, like a Turkish plane, and just the whole country was like having going into a meltdown basically. And uh, yeah, I would have loved to have gone to Alexandria and Egypt, would have been amazing. All right, let's get into brand Sophia, let's call it. There's a lot of interviews. We'll, we'll reference a few of them about your early career. I mean, I think the obvious thing to me is what you said before, you finish uni, you come straight down to freelance. You've had a plethora of roles in freelance positions, the agenda, Lonely Planet, the domain. You work there as a food editor. I found some of the old videos of like doing the reviews and you have this fabulous car. Yes, that, that would definitely be. Well, that would be brand <laughs> domain review. 100%. Which was which was then called the weekly review. It was but, yeah. called the weekly yeah. review then. Um, SPS Food and obviously Fairfax as well. It's pretty obvious. You graduate. There's a GFC going on. Jobs aren't going to be as forthcoming. You've got to go out there and make it your own. I was very intrigued because that is the game now today. the The idea of having a job out of uni as a journalist is just not an idea anymore. And it was it made me think about your personality traits and maybe some people have a suitability for this particular game like you you mentioned in one of the interviews that balance is overrated and I'm (laughs) highly organized I pretty much have lists of my lists (laughs) so assuming you were a newbie getting into this space how much do you think the writing game is dependent on personality and what specific traits do you need for it that's a really interesting question I guess Depends because I've only sort of recently in the last couple of years stopped pigeonholing myself as a writer. Yeah. I mean, at at Monash when I studied journalism, 
I, it was very much written journalism. Uh, you know, they mm. more or less train you up to work for nine, formerly Fairfax. And that whole stylistic training means that there's less work for your editors the second you get in there. So they remember you as a person who they don't have to spend hours working on <laughs> yeah. your your copy. Whereas people who wanted to go into television or radio would tend to go to RMIT when I was studying. Uh-huh. And now I guess it de- the answer to your question would be another question, which is if somebody wants to be specifically a journalist who writes only, it's probably not a realistic career to do just that Mm. anymore Um, so that maybe you find that you do copywriting on the side or, you know, a bit of PR. A lot of journalists, young journalists, end up in PR, which I think is a completely different thing. Yeah. But if you want to sort of go into social media, whether that's helping out other people in your industry or building a, a brand for yourself... It's it's mixed. It's really, really convoluted now. So, so it's good to wear a few hats. Do you view yourself as a creator, journo? What's the title you give yourself if you meet someone on a plane? Journalist. Okay. So they have to view themselves as a journalist and they have to be format agnostic, essentially. Yeah. And the other thing is there are a lot of people who call themselves um, food writers in particular. So I'll, I'll often correct someone if they say, oh, are you a food writer? I can't remember what you said at the start, but it I doesn't. S- I definitely said writer. Well, I, I mean, and I am, but the reason... Oh, no, I reason, did say food writer, sorry. The, no, no, and that, that still works, but the reason it doesn't sit 100% right with me is because there are a lot of food writers who have an Instagram account and work in IT and don't know how to spell. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to necessarily be grouped with that person because I I wrote a 20,000 word thesis. I studied how to be a writer. The written language is what's really important to me. And I love communicating in that way. Hmm. Whereas I see them more as a hobbyist. Okay. So in a way, people, you can't just be one thing. It's It's kind of similar to the copywriters we recently just hired and that you can't just be like a long form copywriter anymore. You can't just be a short form copywriter anymore. You've got to be everything. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's just a sign of where we are in the economy, in the times, you've got to be able to do everything. You can't be nervous on camera. You can't be nervous doing audio, speaking, whatever. You've got to sort of get used to it. Otherwise, maybe you should consider something else. For sure. And if you can write, you can write. So you don't have to necessarily just write about food. Mm. I'm, I'm always a, a little bit cynical when someone says, oh, you know, I, I don't know how to write about that thing. It's like, well, there's research and there are your clients who you can speak to to gain that information. So mm. if, it depends what work you want to do. But if someone asks you to write so, about solar panels and you usually write about food, you should still be able to do that if you're a good writer. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, any good copywriter, any anyone who's been trained in writing should be able to write about anything. Doesn't mean it's going to be fun writing about solar panels, no. but it does mean you're going to be able to pay your and rent. And you should be able to write. Like I, one of the biggest things I notice is people who who need to write like they talk. That to me is like That's the biggest thing. Mm. Do you do you feel the same way, or do you think it's dependent I, on what you're talking about? I think. Mm, it's hard for me. I, I am a talker. Anyone who listens to this who know me will be like, yeah. she doesn't shut up. <laughs> like, because uh, there's a very distinct thing of reading people who write like they talk versus people who are writing to to write. Like, it's it's got a real oh, voice to it. I see what it. you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like I'm a much more eloquent writer than I am a talker. <laughs> Exhibit A, that <laughs> sentence. Fuck. I think it just, <laughs> exactly. I think it just gives you just that, that little bit of extra time to think when something goes from your brain to your hands to a keyboard mm. or you can go back and think of a better word. It definitely gives you more opportunities to communicate what you're trying to say in a much more eloquent way. But in the same breath, that could make you sound a little bit less human. Mm. I, I speak, no, I write smarter than I speak, I would say. Yeah. But personality wise oh I think I'm both of those people I'm both the person who's writing that whatever I'm saying and then the person who's speaking in a way that is obviously me with my voice and my personality as well Mm. so I'm happy to exist in both of those places so long as they're not so 
disassociated, you think it's a different person, that's probably when it becomes an issue. And then only if you're building a personal brand as well, otherwise it doesn't really matter. Yeah. You need to be a chameleon. Well, the thing is, uh, look, um, going back to the point we were talking about earlier being multi-format, I, I was always intrigued, like why, why does someone like yourself notice social when others didn't that is then five, six years down the track really helped you in what you're doing today? Um, you know, I found Life of Jinky. I had no <laughs> idea uh, the life of a toy poodle could be so interesting. Yes, it's also quite inactive. She <laughs> hasn't been doing a very good job lately. She's been busy. <laughs> um, what to you seem like the biggest insight in hindsight during that era where social media, the push of social media was going to be what new media would become? I think you're giving me far too much credit. I think timing played a huge role. Mm. Um, my age sort of being sitting sort of on both sides of the fence as media was changing as a social media user and someone who looked up to traditional journalism mm. probably helped. Um, I guess it was it was less about my foresight and more about me just wanting to be involved in everything. So I guess it would okay. be personality driven. Yeah. I can write. I do have an eye for visuals, imagery, whatever. I take a lot of my own photos for my articles. So I think sort of having different skills in that way meant that I was able to make the most of a platform like Instagram. Mm. And, and I'm still learning all the time and different people consume different sort of content on Instagram as well. Yeah. It makes sense that it was the, the thing to do by necessity. And also for restaurants. I mean, I as I was sort of starting with all of that, restaurants probably started a, a year, 18 months, two years later, sort mm. of, you know, presenting their brand to people in this way through these platforms that I'd, I'd been on for a year already. Mm. So in a roundabout way, that, that was a huge advantage because then people started asking me to help them with that, which is yeah. something I do far less of now just because I'm concentrating on all, all my own sort of stuff. But it was it was flattering because it's not something, f at, when I was studying anyway, it's not something that you studied and now I believe it is. But this is the thing, like you, you say I give you too much credit, but I often think why didn't I think about <laughs> that at the time when I was so obsessed with getting involved in that sort of epicure slash hospitality industry? Why didn't I notice that thing more? I was already reading, there was a blog of this, this lady, I can't remember her name, but it was a Melbourne-based blog and she would go and basically taste... Oh, there would have been heaps of them, but she would have gone to many different restaurants and she would do her tasting. I was like, wow, she's better than Debecky and all these other high, you know, profile reviewers or whatever. And also working at the press club, like, we've got photos of all these mm -hmm. reviewers mm -hmm. to know specifically if they came in what to do, but she's, like, almost anonymous. That's that's right, funny though. Name. Now that you say that, is because now the some kitchens have pictures of faces from social media <laughs> yeah. as next to the reviewers' faces yeah. as well. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just I think like why why didn't I know that? And I guess you can put it down to personality and being persistent. I think it's just FOMO. My FOMO is stronger than yours, mate. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Do you find that you're a very extroverted person? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I think the extroversion definitely helps. I, I know I am extroverted, but I do have like slight tendencies where I just need to chill the fuck out and get away yeah, from people. I, well. I don't love chilling out. I don't love doing – I mean, thing, even things like travelling by yourself, I think one of the reasons I like it is because you're never really by yourself. It's an opportunity to do things on <laughs> your own schedule. And, find other people, yeah. and yeah, and to meet new people. Absolutely. You. Yes, you. Are you intrigued by this episode? If so, go to our footer on the website, n-e-u-r-a-l-l-e.com, neural.com. We're going to give you an insight each week. It's going to be on business, marketing, or a topic that we covered in the episode at all. We'd love your support, and it would help us in developing the intellect around this series. But without going on too much longer, let's get back into this episode. The seasoned traveller, this is sort of the, the chief focus now. Interestingly, a culinary travel website mm -hmm. amidst COVID. Uh, I like the eat curiously hashtag and focus. I was saying in a previous interview for a while that we really need 
something like this specific to Melbourne. I'd gotten sort of sick of just maybe because I'd grown out of just going to fine dining restaurants. I wanted stuff where I could just eat homely food. And I felt like yours did that, not directly, because a lot of your stuff was just about finding stories as opposed to, you know, street eats or this cuisine or that cuisine. So I, I was just intrigued. What What's the whole plan for this thing? Where Where does, I think the quote was, home is where the food is is that the quote? <laughs> Do you know what? That's that's funny. That's that in you the title description. Yeah, so that that was just me trying to figure out how <laughs> when I shared the homepage to social media, how to make it come up with something more interesting than just home. Yeah. <laughs> so I just added that in brackets, <laughs> which is great because that means it's working. Because only last week it wasn't. It yeah, right. Caught, it hadn't refreshed yet. <laughs> that's hilarious. So yeah, what what does this whole thing mean to you when you're just standing there daydreaming about? things, what is the seasoned traveller, what do you want it to be? I guess seasoned traveller for me, initially, the idea was about a platform where everything I sort of do and believe in can exist, which is celebrating cultural diversity through food, sharing those stories and in a multimedia fashion as well. So the writing, yes, always. I mean, that's my background. That's where I've come from. But also just a place for more and more video content to live just because if you want to get a message out there, not everybody wants to read 300, 600, 1,200 words deep diving into a cuisine or a culture. Mm-hmm. For some people, the storytelling is visual. And I think it it would be an oversight to just have written content on a, a website or a publication like that. Uh, I suppose looking forward, it'd be great to have season traveller not only be something that shares the stories of people who might be underrepresented, but also have writers or talent who are underrepresented mm. doing the same thing as well. So call it contributors, whatever that looks like. Okay. Uh, or even, you know, having a season traveller show or podcast or anything. I just think exploring as many mediums as possible to get that message out about eating curiously and, you know, ordering and exploring outside your comfort zone so that you can learn more about others, but also your own biases as well, which I think is as big a thing. Often you have to check yourself when you're looking at a menu. (laughs) So you want to build something, basically it sounds like you want to build something bigger than just you and your name. Yeah, absolutely. But whatever the fastest route is to reaching the average eater as opposed to the average person and just making them think about food mm. as something more than just sustenance or more than avocado and toast in Melbourne on a <laughs> on a Sunday or Saturday morning. I just think there's so much opportunity for food to be that medium where it's a window into something else. So who who are the what are the publications you think about that you really enjoy that you're pulling idea not ideas but structure and style from today? Visually I think I would always aspire to something like Netflix's street food, for example, just because you don't even have to love food at all to be completely engaged in something like that visually. It's just beautiful. The Mm. sound, um, the learnings around that, the storytelling is incredible. That's sort of the ultimate, I think, in terms of visually. In terms of written content, there's not nothing I've really based what I do off. It's very much my own style, uh, which is probably why I had to put it in a website that wasn't someone else's. But there are, there are sort of parts that you can pull from. Um, so there are a lot of newsletters, e-newsletters that go out now that might show people's personalities or cultures that are a lot more niche. Um, I think SBS Food, who I write for, mm. just to get my biases out um, straight away, they do a great job at sharing these stories and not necessarily having to cover a person or a dish that's really well known or brand new or a celebrity chef. I like the sort of short social media friendly nippy news style of a publication like eater.com yeah, yeah. which um you know s- some people don't like because their take on diversity hasn't been great <laughs> recently but <laughs> it's sort of taking all the best parts I hope of publications that exist already, 
but then hmm. sharing stories and content that I just think, for whatever reason, has been mostly overlooked. Yeah. Well, that was the thing that I wrote here is like when it comes to leaders, people you look to, I know that in an old interview, you mentioned you're a fan of Gail Green, A.A. Gill. I will always remember this clip of A.A. Gill and Ramsey having an argument. I don't think I've seen that one. It's like from when, uh, what was his first TV show, Boiling Point or something like that? When like as a young Ramsey in his first kitchen, they're going for like three stars, three Michelin stars or whatever. Uh, Jeffrey Steingarten, Jonathan Gold. But I always, like when I saw a lot of your videos, I got a very distinct Maeve O'Meara and Food Safari vibes. Yeah, Maeve's amazing. That's a huge compliment. Um, And I did wonder whether she was, part of your inspiration or I guess if you're pulling from all these different people, you just sort of start to define it in your own way, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I love, I absolutely love what she does. Um, and and in a roundabout way, would probably say I'm, I think, more similar to what she is and stands for and what she's doing than people have probably referenced as, you know, heroes or yeah. people I look up to in the past. I mean, even hearing you repeat some of those names back now, they seem less relevant than whenever that interview was, I guess, because, I mean, it's a slightly older generation. I don't agree with some of the masculinity around some of those people (laughs) and how they present themselves. I mean, there would have been a time not so long ago where I would have been like, fuck yeah, I want to be Anthony Bourdain. That's the next person. He's my hero. I Mm. love him. But that's, I, I don't really want a seat at that table anymore. Times have changed. I want to create my own table and I want, you know, young women to feel like they can go out and get their hands dirty, talking, reading, writing about food and not necessarily just end up in a shiny kitchen doing the Nigella thing, which is fine. People can do that. But I would I would much rather be a young woman who's not afraid of getting a little bit of food poisoning on camera if it means that you're going to be able to share someone's <laughs> culture and story and embrace difference in that way. Yeah. Yeah, Maeve O'Meara, I feel like that's that's the most accurate way of looking at it. I just remember always like, <laughs> it's so funny, hindsight. I feel like I was talking about it the other week in the interview. We'd like sit down Friday nights and we'd have like, because we just didn't get takeaway food. Mum, Mum would do like, You know, now everyone likes all these new takes on things. Like for a while it was um, sort of that med um, Levantine style uh, pita type pizza thing. And we would always have that for like dinner on a Friday night. And mum would call it like um, uh, not pizza muffins, just something (laughs) like real basic and like we'd be so stoked about it. And we'd watch because they would always watch SBS. So we'd watch stuff like that. Uh, olive oil would be at a premium. <laughs> Some of us were allowed to have it. If you didn't like it, you were absolutely not to have it because it was so bloody expensive by the leader. Um, it's bringing back a lot of memories for me and I just remember watching that show and thinking like, man, can we cook this? Can we, can we cook that? And it was, I don't know, is she still going on yeah. SBS in terms of... Well, she's just started doing food tours in Sydney. Really? I believe, yes. I saw something crop like up as in, in broadsheet. Like walking tours? I believe so, but I wouldn't want to be Fuck. quoted on it. But there was a broadsheet article if she talking was, about the details. I do wonder whether they, uh, how far in advance they'd be selling out. <laughs> um, you've had a lot of time now, I guess, to build your own style of writing over the years. Many different publications, you would have built your own process. I understand from a prior interview that... Basically, you seem to have a similar way of going about it myself. You basically take a deep dive, you gather as much info as possible on the person or the brand or whatever you're writing on, and then you just start writing. But when it comes to just start writing, do you have a certain structure of things that you need to hit to, you know, for your list of list type mind to get things right and not get stuck? Most of the time, I'm telling other people's stories. Okay. So I'll base what I'm writing off what I think is going to be the strongest start to sort of draw people in. And that might just be a sentence or a topic that someone said in an interview. Okay. Um, so I, I spend way too much time on it. A, a fellow journalist slash one of my former um, uni tutors actually sent me a message the other day and said, what, what, uh, what app, what website are you using at the moment to transcribe your interviews? <laughs> I was like, 
Huh? None. <laughs> <laughs> I, I listen to them and I write them out. And he's like, you're insane. So actually just this morning, I'm trialing one. So we'll see how we go. Is it otter.ai? No, I think it's called Rev. Okay. Yeah, I know Rev. I believe. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's. It's affordable, but it's, it's not like affordable. it's. It depends what cheap is for you. You know, yeah. you know, if you're sitting down speaking to someone for an hour and a half, and you're writing an article for broadsheet, <laughs> it's going to cost more to transcribe than it will. Yeah, to we've write gone. The we've gone through this whole process. What did we look? We looked at like otter.ai. Like we considered whether Jacob would even transcribe the whole thing. You, you do learn moment. more, but it's it's a lot. And it's a this, lot of work. This particular article I'm writing, it's no one's paying me. It's for Season Traveler. It's a personal interest. I've gone out and sent emails to so many people, and I'm always still surprised at how many people actually get back to me. So now I've probably got eight interviews lined up for one feature art. It's just too many, mm. <laughs> but I still enjoy it. I'm learning so much. So the, the process definitely changes, but the thing that remains the same is I do too much work <laughs> on yeah. it. Um, but that means that often I'll, I'll have the knowledge next time, whatever the next time is, whether it's another article or someone I can call in the future. Um, and I, I enjoy those conversations. They don't feel like work when I'm learning something and getting to listen to somebody else. Yeah. It, it's interesting that you sort of um, don't have a defined process. However, there is a process of just... And I think w once you just know something, that's when your voice starts to come out. For sure. And process, I think, for journalism is very deadline-driven. So oh, yeah, when you're yeah. sending something to an editor or publishing something, often how happy you are with it is reflective of how much time you've had to actually do it. Yeah. When you think about how you interview, what's what's something different that you do in your interviews that a um, an interview host like this could learn from you, do you think? Hmm, I'm not entirely sure. That's another good question. Uh, I mean, all the normal things that I think an interviewer should do, like active listening, hmm research the hell out of everyone and everything before you actually go in there. I suppose when I feel like I've done a good job at being an interviewer is when someone on the other end says, oh, that's a great question. Yeah. And if I can get one of them in <laughs> every interview, I'm happy. Or um, like you've done your research or something mm. like that. I do ask, I'll always, always ask if there's something else that someone would like to add yeah. or if they wish that in previous interviews their interviewer had asked them something they didn't. <laughs> That's so funny you mentioned that because that has been like my go-to outside left of field non-topical question. Mm. What's funny when you read other people's interviews is there's always sort of some meme or idea that <laughs> permeates your interviews that is quite repetitive and is repeated. So I, I always try and get away from that stuff. I mean, an, an easy way to do that is what's something you've never told anybody else in an interview. Yeah. But then if you put someone on the spot with that, they often can't think of it. No, they can't <laughs> think of it. But I, I, was, I always say, what's, what's the question you get all the time that you can't stand or are bored by? And also, what topic do you wish you could cover? And it doesn't even have to be related to food. Oh, that's a question. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's not fair. <laughs> I want to ask you the same thing. So the question was, what what question? There were two. I think it was, what bores me? <laughs> yeah, what bores the shit out of you? And what do you wish you could talk what about? What do I wish I could talk about? Do you know about? you could talk about for like half an hour? I mean, I, I am really happy with the, the topics that I get asked about. More so now because it's it's all related to season traveler and things I'm doing, which has been, you know, essentially a lifetime of me figuring out how I can finally talk in a way about the things that I like to talk about. Yeah. The question that bores me, just because it's impossible to, to answer, I think, is when someone asks either what my favorite restaurant is oh, yeah. or what my favorite food is. And then it's like, well, you can you give me one. a suburb? Is it a desert island question? Is there a budget I have to stick to? Is does it have to be an iconic restaurant? Is it one you've never heard of? And so then I shoot back all of these questions and they get intimidated and run away. Yeah. But also if you did put that out there anyway, if you just think about it, like you kind of fucked as a writer. <laughs> like, because then everyone would like pull back to this soundbite and be like, oh, but she doesn't like Italian anyway because her favorite food is this or that. Exactly. So yeah, it's I always very find true. that one funny. 
Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. That's a recent thing I've been able to integrate because I had someone on who's a photographer and we talked for 30 minutes about personal finance. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, I have absolutely no interest in talking about personal finance. No, I know. Probably but... also shouldn't take it from me. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like we all have these yeah. topics that we could talk about um, for ages. Oh, gosh. I. It's like last week we had in um, this guy, Hayden Peterson. He's like a um, videographer, storyteller type individual and what do we talk about for like 60 minutes meditation we talked about meditation mm, yeah for yeah ages. no this is the thing is people are like what are your hobbies I'm like i am literally I working work. my hobbies yeah. it's, which is fine <laughs> that's uh, that's the same with me which i'm which i'm happy about that's good i would rather that than you know have to be like oh um no but you're i saw your bonsais you're yeah, you yeah. have you have things outside of of marketing I and do. podcasting and i do although it is kind of like I wish it was more ingrained because the bonsai thing, I could do it more often if I had more space. Like mm. I, I can do that stuff. Well, then you'd be a gardener. Then you'd have yeah, real trees that were real sized. Yeah, but <laughs> like I'm thinking about because, you know, if, when you get to certain months with the bonsai, you're really busy and you're busy for like a whole of a Saturday or a Sunday or whatever, but then it's all done. Yeah. And then they're just looking pretty there. And you're like, I just want to bring people in yeah. like, hey, bonsai. <laughs> yeah, there's, I don't, I don't have a thing. I don't have a thing that I would talk about. I'm just trying to think if I have friends over for a dinner party or if I'm out somewhere, I always end up talking about food and or travel. And often the travel is food related. Dogs? Only because people ask. Mm. Or when I'm trying to relate to a friend who has a baby and they just give me this look like, your dog is not a baby. Don't even try to understand me. <laughs> Do you know what's so funny? We've had this radio pair on and she, what the, the female co-host always talks about the fact that her cat is like a baby and the, the male co-host has two kids and they get into this debate all the time. Oh, well, surely a dog is more like a baby than a cat, first of I all. I think so. I've just missed the point of yeah. what you've said, clearly, <laughs> again. but <laughs> um, I listened to an interview where you spoke about food storytelling and to be honest, there's not much... I think we've already covered it where the fact that it, it breaks down a lot of stuff that can be political, breaks down barriers. That there is nothing more innate than food and conversation. I feel like I always think about sort of hunter-gatherers sitting at a fire, discussing, sharing food, all that sort of stuff. It feels like a very innate thing. And I was just intrigued, like for you, what is, over all this time, you've built these principles, you've covered different types of food, different publications. What's never really changed about the game that you're in at all? Do you know what's just, just popped into my mind? So I'll share it because... I guess it's a gut feeling. I think up until right this moment, the word storytelling has probably been the only one I've been able to use to describe what I do or what journalists do or whatever else. Mm. But that's not entirely true. We've probably just become stuck with the buzzword, which mm. is storytelling. Because what you're actually doing or what I'm actually doing when I do my job well is acting as a conduit between the person or the culture or the food that's involved in a story or interview mm -hmm. and the reader. So I'm, I'm essentially the middleman. The messenger. The messenger. You can write in a way that has an element of prose or storytelling to it, which I think is the skill that will enable somebody to connect with what you're writing. Mm -hmm. But your job, first and foremost, is to adequately do give justice to the person on the other end who's given you the trust, the privilege, you know, the time um, to share their story. So I guess if you're sharing somebody else's story, does that make you a storyteller? Does it make you a conduit? I'm not entirely sure, but just as you said yeah, that Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, actually. Because um, that's part of the thing, like you have a yearning, like you were talking before about the best compliment for you as an interviewer is someone saying, oh, that was a great question or you did your research or something like that. Maybe maybe it is that like there's this, I don't know, I always have it, it's this like internal guilt that I just want to make sure the interviewer is so good that they say that so that you've done... You, you've given justice to the time that they've spent here with you. That's it, the way yeah, I feel about it. It's a funny thing because especially in this social media world and doing more and more screen and things like that, I'm very aware that people connect 
with me or to me and that enables them to feel like maybe they know me and a lot of people do and therefore they want to listen to the story of somebody else that I'm sharing. But I want it to be as little about me as possible while still balancing the me version of that because we, you know, we live in a world of personal brand where people mm. want to connect to Bourdain or Maeve or Jemima or whoever it is who's reviewing on paper or on screen. So there's a, an element of that that you need, but ultimately it's, a, it's about the other stuff, which is everything that's not you. It mm. just falls to your ability to communicate in a way that is either um, engaging, easy to read, easy to connect with based on personality. So it's, that's a real balancing act and one yeah. that I I'm, I'm, guess I'm comfortable with because I'm confident, borderlining on precocious, but, but one that makes me feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable or definitely gives me imposter syndrome because I'm, I'm taking a story of somebody else that I wish people just knew or I wish people would put the effort and time into finding out themselves or researching. But, you know, everybody's busy. Everybody lives within their bubble. I guess the difference is that my default is to think beyond what I know because that just happens to be what interests me. Mm. And so I, as much as I can say I'm a storyteller and people might agree, what I actually am is a researcher and a conduit. Yeah, it's, and it's very hard. It's so funny you say that because, like, I've had this weird imposter syndrome where people say, like, oh, you interviewed this person and, oh, wow, you're this person who hosts this show that interviews these people and I'm just like, fuck, I'm just a guy, man. Like, I, I'm a nobody, if that makes sense, which I am. Like, I don't pretend to have some sort of high profile at all, but, yeah, it's a weird setting to be in, isn't it? Mm, but it does, it does help people find what's beyond the you as well. Mm. Um, and I mean, f for me, one of the reasons that's important is because I, I don't love the way that women are portrayed in general, but also in hospitality and, and media. So if, if I can simultaneously, while being that researcher slash conduit for other people, while using the myself bit to hopefully set an example mm. for, for other women, especially other young journalists or people who would like to be journalists, then that's, that's a bonus and I'm happy to plaster my face everywhere if people think that they don't have to present a certain way okay. as, you know, dictated by society. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have that North Star yet. I need, I need to get it. Um, right, let's jump into some rapid-fire questions to finish things off. Uh Morning and evening routine, what does it look like? Pre-COVID, post-COVID? Uh, Post-COVID. Post-COVID. Uh, evening routine affects the morning routine. The evening routine is staying up way too late, yeah. researching something for season traveller <laughs> that takes too much time and ending up in a internet hole with a list of ideas and a whole lot of emails that I'm so tired when I send, I don't necessarily remember sending them the next day, yeah. but it still gets results. And then the morning routine will be in a perfect world, getting up and going for a big run. That's when I feel the best, but that's okay. realistically two or three times a week, not every morning. You're not still waking up at 5.30, are you? I am not still waking <laughs> up at 5.30, not when I'm going to bed at that hour. No. But I used to wake up at 5.30 and go boxing, and now I probably wake up closer to 7 and go for a big run. <laughs> I did receive a late email from you about... Um, this week's interview, although it's not late for me to be interviewing people, at, uh, interviewing, emailing people at 10.30 at night is not, that's like early for me. That's normal for yeah. me too. Yeah. I was in a call at like 11, 11.30 last night. So that's always fun. Um, if you could have a billboard anywhere in Melbourne, where would it be and what would it say? This was the only rapid fire question that I had an answer to, but you have changed the question <laughs> from yeah. anywhere in the world to Melbourne. Yeah. I want to know Melbourne. Oh, we have gone local after COVID. Yeah, that's so. true. Well, I guess I can't say Times Square anymore. What's the equivalent of Times Square in Melbourne? Fed well, Square? We've, sort of, we've sort of settled on Fed Square, Punt Road or the airport. There's that Ooh, big one on the airport which, on the way out. I quite like the idea of Punt Road because I like that you get people crossing north to south and south to north. Yeah. And obviously it would have to say Eat Curiously. With a website link. Of course. <laughs> but eat also curiously. just because I think people would be like, what does that even mean? Yeah, I like to eat. Well, they would be curious for eating curiously. And I, I, 
I'm quite proud of myself, I must say, for for finding or not finding, for associating with the word curious because I do feel like and since I first wrote about eating curiously maybe two or three years ago, it seems to be something that's cropped up a lot, which I'm thrilled about because now people want to associate themselves with being a curious person, which is perfect because everybody should be. Yeah. So to sort of attach that to eating is brilliant. That's exactly where I want to be and what I want people to do. It's also in line with what has happened in media anyway. We've been bombarded with content. It's now about quality and dissection and analysis and all that sort of stuff that gives something different. And to be curious is to be different, I think, and to find that. Well, I think I I would like to think that being curious should be the default as opposed to singling people out as being different. I sort of see it as being open-minded hmm. and I think, aren't. well, yeah, I guess, I guess not. Otherwise I wouldn't have a website built yeah, around that you, exact you thing. I mean, the fact is my dad still likes going to Danny line in Outwood. Yeah. Which, <laughs> is, just which wants, is a great restaurant. It's a great restaurant. But the fact is like he, you know, if we have a family dinner, like he's, he's very, you know, there's just people mm. that are like that. So because of that, there will always be an opportunity, I think. But don't get me wrong that there is room for all of that. I mean, I'm, I'm off to lunch after this at a at a nice restaurant that is not something I would put on season traveller. But you're right. You know the the chef's really talented. Um, the restaurant's fantastic, and I want those experiences as well. But I'm not going to end up writing about things like that because everyone else already is. Can we say the restaurant? Yeah, it's Amaru. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, she works with Charlie Carrington, her being the co-owner. Yes, I was going to say. Uh, what's her first name again? Oh, you're going to ask me questions. I should know yeah, the answer I to on a podcast. Too. but she had a, she had a bub and she was away for a bit. I, I know the partner. I remember they and Charlie Carrington ran like a pop-up restaurant at Clayton Bowls Club. Cool. Like ages ago, like six years ago. It was yeah. fucking amazing. That wasn't... Now I'm just now I'm just chatting because that's where um, Pete Gunn essentially started at Ides after Attica. He did Bowls Club. Bowls Clubs are the I've places no to idea. look for fresh young talent. But it was bizarre because we walk past the pokies. Yeah. Take a little over to this like little side room, and that was their great space. It was amazing. I think it's just they they had all come back from overseas and they wanted to experiment, mm-hmm. and it was so cheap. It was like eighty bucks for like ten courses, something ridiculous. So good. Um, and I remember taking my cousins there because they'd moved to the outer suburbs. They're in Mulgrave, Keysborough area. And they're like, fuck, there's good food out here. Why doesn't anyone else do this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Clayton's great. All right. Last question for you. Best purchase under $200. Oh, I was really hoping you wouldn't ask me that one. <laughs> I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. The most, the thing that I use the most. Um, Could be a chew toy for the dog. That is under $200. And I'm new to this is an air fryer. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> but I'm not I'm not crazy passionate about it like other people. For me, it's it's purely practical. So if I want to eat food that isn't covered in salt and fat and all delicious things like I do most or every day at a restaurant, then I can just chuck some veggies in there. Let's let's be honest, like. Most people are intrigued by an air fryer. It's an interesting piece of tech. Well, the thing is, with Thermomix that everyone was obsessed with, oh, man, I very that. high barrier to entry very does high. not fit into the two hundred dollar question. Yeah. More like two grand. Yeah. So the the air fryer is the kitchen tool of the people, and it's you know it's it's old school. People used to have them, and now they're back. It's a good point. I remember my mum bought a Thermomix, and it was such like a oh man back even back then. So we're talking like. What year are we now? 2021. So let's say it was 2012 or something, 10 years ago-ish. It was a pretty big purchase. I yeah. remember like they'd come out, they'd show you it. You'd get like a trial period of a day or so. And she's still got it today though. They're amazing devices, but you're right. They're wholly like unrealistic for most people. Do you know what's well under $200 that is a purchase I would recommend everyone make? Crockpot. No, <laughs> is a paid subscription to their favourite newspaper and or magazine and or newsletter because if there's anything that's going to keep mm. journalism afloat and independent, whether that's food or something else, it's a dollar twenty on the paper or yeah. whatever it is a month for, I don't know, any anything really. I would underline that. I've recently started supporting Stepmates, Stepmates Studios, five bucks a month, best investment ever. It's less than a coffee a week, 
and you're supporting these guys and they then put it back into other things. They just bought lighting. Great. Of all things. These are the people who sold the show to Channel 7. So they're trying to build up their Patreon and, um, yeah, I yeah, would Patreons. 100% recommend that. I say, and this is the thing, right? Like I've, I have an audience. I have people who I know will pay for content. I've just been trained to give it away. And I've still, yeah. people say, you know, make Season Traveller because there's a, a newsletter that goes out every fortnight. You know, make it Patreon, make a version of it this. And I'm just like, oh, I don't think I can yet. <laughs> well, I, to be fair, though, just on that, I think some people can get away with being more commercial by working with brands and some people just can't. Like stepmates could never work with a brand. They're just not, they're too out there. Hmm. And I would um, rather do that. I would rather readers don't have to pay for content yeah. or viewers and that there, and I I have started working with some and I just hope there are more, but there are brands who see value in what you're doing and maybe it aligns with their brand pillars, but they still let you be fairly um, autonomous, ideally completely autonomous, mm. but just you get to sort of, you know, classic content marketing, put their branding onto what you're doing without necessarily having to change what you're doing. And, you know, yeah. maybe I just live in this naive head in the cloud bubbles because that is the perfect world. <laughs> yeah, it's, ho it's horses for courses, I think, and I think your brand can pull it off quite easily. Let's so, hope so. Let's hope so. Sophia, thank you so much for coming in. I know you've got to get off to lunch, but um, where can people find you on the interwebs? Seasoned Traveller, two L's, because we are using BritishEnglish.com for sure. Um, and then Instagram as well is a good one for me. So we've got Seasoned Traveller HQ mm -hmm. and then... Sophia K11. Yeah, don't forget the K. Don't forget the K or you'll end up with someone else. Yeah. Uh, we'll link all of that in the show notes. If anyone wants to find out what you're doing, it's all there. But um, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. I hope you haven't been listening to my stomach grumble through these super no. high-tech mics. <laughs> no. I couldn't hear it. Could you hear it? Oh, we're all good. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. If you do like it, please subscribe. And of course, like if you're watching the YouTube video as well. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. You can also find our clips channel in the description. For audio, if you're not already listening, you can search Uncommon on Pocket Cast, Spotify and Apple Podcasts quite easily. For video, if you're not watching, you can search Uncommon on YouTube. And for behind the scenes takes and clips, uh, on social media, then definitely check out at uncommon underscore show on Instagram. But otherwise, look, thanks so much for tuning in. And until next time, thanks for listening.